Everyone loves Minidisc. It's a perennial 90s favorite, both then and now. Of course, the reasons are a little different. In the 90s, it was partly because it was genuinely cool and useful, and now it's because, well, besides looking more futuristic than anything we ended up getting in the future, where we now live, it also has this permanent, inexplicable feeling of being a rare, failed product that, in fact, is neither of those things. It occupies this weird niche. Anyone can have a mini disc player if they want one. I think I got this for 10 bucks. You can just go on eBay and find them for anything between 30 and $300, depending on how much mini disc you want. And this is because Sony produced 22 million of them over the course of two decades at every conceivable price point. They got purchased by all the same sort of people who bought iPods in 2003. Except that when MP3 players hit the market, these all got cycled out, went to thrift stores and whatnot. So they've just been clogging up the secondary market for 20 years now. So it's not hard to get one. And yet, everyone who owns one, myself included, feels like they have some sort of rare artifact. There is this energy to them, which I would describe as having the failed product nature. Minidisc feels like a Sony format, developed at extreme cost, way ahead of its time, dumped on a market that didn't actually ask for it, not allowed to be manufactured by anybody but Sony, and encumbered with limitations in DRM that refused to concede anything to the public's wants or needs. And it's several of those things, but actually not most of them, because it was made by all sorts of companies and was incredibly successful. It's not like, say, WVHS, where you have to spend years looking for a working player, and then more years looking for working media. They're thick on the ground. You can just have a mini disc player if you want one. It's in Sony's nature, however, to make products that are very cool, but also super weird or way too expensive. So they couldn't resist making a mini disc that was a failure. And so we got MD Data. MD Data came out in about 1993. Now compared to the original MD, which was intended only for audio and had a capacity rated in minutes, this one is actually rated in megabytes because it's intended to be used as a general purpose data storage medium. Sony probably imagined this replacing the floppy or magneto optical drive in people's PCs. Magneto optical was a format introduced in the mid 80s, which was sort of like CDRW, but a lot wackier, where CDRW uses a die, which changes opacity when it's heated up by a laser. The magneto optical disc actually uses a common combination of a laser and a magnetic head to read and write data. It's, it's super funky. Maybe I'll do a whole video on it someday. MO offered exceptional storage capacity and flexibility compared to any other technology available before the 2000s. However, I don't think it really had any consumer uptake, at least not here. It did enjoy some success in commercial applications, and who knows, maybe it was big in Japan. I haven't looked into why this is because this video isn't about magneto-optical. I mention all this because Minidisc itself is also a magneto-optical format. My understanding is it's pretty much the same technology, just shrunk down. I would guess that Sony had hoped MD Data would allow them to take the MO format, which had been successful in the commercial sector, and finally find a way to sell it to the consumer market. Well, despite the success of audio minidisc, MD data didn't take off. As usual, Sony spent years improving its capacity and capabilities, while it remained virtually impossible to find anything you could actually put it in. While the pro market got some digital photo recorders and a couple of audio workstations, in the consumer market they put out a couple of drives for use in a PC, a couple of like early ebook readers, and virtually nothing else. Now my interest always tends towards the photographic, and there were in fact a couple of MD data cameras. Sony put out the DSC MD1 in 1997, and in fact earlier that year Sharp put out their own MD PS1. Both of these were pretty basic digital cameras that could take still photos, record audio, or play ordinary audio mini discs. Of course I would love to have these to review, but realistically they probably don't do anything spectacular. The specs say they only shoot 640x480, and in 1999 that was already looking kind of ridiculous. And I doubt they worked any miracles even at that resolution. Many years later, in the mid-2000s, Sony would produce their last minidisc-based still camera, which as far as I can tell was no more impressive than the ones that had preceded it. But before this forgettable swan song to the world of photography, minidisc did take one far more ambitious voyage. In 1999, Sony produced this, the DCM-M1, as far as I know, the only production minidisc camcorder. If minidisc players were as common as iPods in their day, then that would make this the iOmega Hip Zip, a device that's so obscure that even the really high power nerds have no idea it exists. This thing was an ordeal to track down because nobody bought them, so I had to wait quite some time to find a lead on one, and then of course I had to buy two of them in order to get an essential accessory that was bundled with this guy, which is Japanese and of course doesn't work. Fortunately, this one does work. 
Now, to my longtime viewers, I acknowledge that I keep making videos where I just talk shit on weird old camcorders. I promise I have camcorders I like and would love to show you, just the crappy ones keep pushing themselves to the top of my list. Of course, that's because they're rare or unique, which in turn is because there were experiments that were tried once, miserably failed, and were never tried again. I thought this camera was also one of those, and I was prepared to just talk for an hour about how much I hate it. And to be fair, it does have one great, big, miserable flub. Sony made a gigantic error in their design of this thing, and to my modern eyes, it overshadows all of its other qualities. But I caught myself. I got my head straight, rewrote my script, and instead I'll be telling you about how awesome this thing is, and how many things Sony got right, and why it's a shame that they never made a follow-up. Because you see, a mini disc camcorder was a great idea, and it didn't really stop being one. I spent an entire feature-length video talking about how the DVD camcorders of the 2000s were unsung heroes that solved a whole litany of problems that had plagued camcorders for decades. But the disc cam beat them all to market by two years, and it was a hero of a different stripe, or wanted to be. It wanted to change the way that people made videos and to make it easier and more accessible. Let me show you what Sony wanted the future to look like. So, here it is. And it's not a poorly built device. All the panels are made out of metal and it's nice and solid. No rattles, not unseasonably heavy. I really like the overall look. Um, it actually looks a lot less like a camcorder and a lot more like a sort of a Y2K era personal media device which makes sense since it is derived from Sony's music player line. I think a lot of what's doing it is this metallic blue paint. I don't know if I've ever seen that particular shade on anything else, and I dig it. Typical for the time, it's got both the eyepiece viewfinder and the flip-out LCD. I actually hate eyepieces, so I particularly appreciate how large and bright this one is. I also dig the little placard on the side, kind of self-promotion label. It was typical of 80s and 90s Japanese electronics. Kind of faded away after the early 2000s. The controls are fairly clear and ergonomic, which certainly not all camcorders could claim then or now. Uh, this one has a lot of stuff available right at your fingertips. Uh, backlight control, focus control, zoom, still photo, and then of course record. Uh, and then with your offhand, you can reach the multi-control dial here, menu, exposure, and then here's your playback controls over here. On the back, you've got your typical mode switch with play and record, although there's a position past record called interview, and the play position is split with edit mode, which we'll be talking a lot about later. On the front, you've got the usual stuff, stereo mic, the lens, your record indicator, and then under this flap, you've got S-video, composite out, audio out, headphones, and then mic and remote inputs. Now, it's kind of tough at first to figure out where the disc goes. Doesn't seem to be a door. The release is actually here on the bottom, uh, and if you pull it, it won't do anything. You actually have to flip the LCD open first and then it'll eject. And so there is our mini disc, which I won't be showing you until much later in the video. So the physical design is pretty nice, uh, although I don't like this weird hump on the side that you grip it on. It's uncomfortable and unsightly, but we'll come back to it later and I'll tell you why I think it's there. For now, let's turn it on and see how it works. For usability, we'll start with the basics. Camera mode is about the same as most other consumer camcorders of the era. You get a nice clear picture on the LCD, simple labels and indicators, and shooting is as easy as pressing record. Let's see what that looks like. So the picture is all right. Like the colors are natural and all, but it feels a little low resolution. The manual says that it records at 704 by 480, which is the low end of DVD resolutions, but it feels like it's less than that. It just feels a little soft. I don't know if it comes across in the video here. For comparison, I went out and shot some video at one of Seattle's lakes. I tried to get a variety of subjects. I filmed animals. I filmed plants. I filmed people. I filmed action. And I filmed inaction. And while I struggled to describe the objective quality of video, the color and dynamic range look good, I think. The motion looks good, and while I think I can see the effects of heavy compression, they don't really bother me. The resolution issue is kind of noticeable, but it's still fairly watchable, and it would probably have looked better on a conventional TV instead of my 4K monitor. I don't have a period television handy, but I set up my Sony EVM here. It was prograde when it was new, but since it's small and over 10 years older than the camera, consumer TVs had probably caught up or passed it in terms of resolution, so I'll go with this. 
On this set, I'd say the picture looks just fine. I have the feeling the footage might not have held up on a 36 inch TV with S video input, but for the most part, it seems passable. I like the colors, I like the detail, I can watch someone's vacation videos on this. Now, this is also one of the first camcorders to allow recording at different bit rates. The default is eight megabit, but you can also record at four megabit or variable bit rate. Let's take a look at those. Here we are shooting in the eight megabit mode with the uh, foliage back here to really challenge the compression. This here is the variable bitrate mode. And this is the 4 megabit mode. I'm not great at this kind of comparison. I feel like I don't see a huge difference between these. Maybe the lower bit rates would do worse with high motion, for instance, but I don't have a great way to test that. Overall, they all look just kind of all right. So this might not have been your best buy if you were looking for a top grade picture, but I mean, it's not a professional camcorder. The manual has pictures of moms and golf swings, so I don't think they were aiming for the broadcast industry here. Overall, the shooting features are not atypical for the era. You press the focus button and rotate the ring on the lens to manually focus. You adjust the exposure by pressing the button and then rotating the thumb wheel, that sort of thing. In the menu are a number of other typical settings like image stabilization, high-speed shutter, digital zoom, white balance, etc. But a noticeably missing feature is digital effects. There's no sepia tone, no black and white, no mosaic. I'll explain why that is later. A feature that wasn't all that common, I think, was the self-timer mode, which waits 10 seconds before it starts recording and then records for, by default, 10 more seconds and then stops automatically. So you can take a clean video selfie. It's a pretty neat feature. The next feature, which I'm almost certain was unique, is the picture in picture, which shows you the last frame of the last video or picture that you took in the corner while you're shooting. This is interesting because I can see how this would be appealing to professionals, so you can carefully match up one shot with another one. But to a casual user, I'm not so sure what you would use it for. It's also interesting that the manual doesn't mention it at all, so I have to figure it was probably added late in production. I think it's just a flex, really. While this could have partially been done on a videotape-based camcorder, it's a lot easier to do on a random access medium. So I think Sony might have just been showing up the rest of the industry. As with basically all camcorders of this era, you can also take still photos. Now, since it's not tape-based, it actually saves them as JPEGs, which is cool, but they're only 640 by 480, which I think kind of sucked even in 1999. The final recording option is interview mode, which I don't really think deserves its own position on the selector. This could have just been a button. It allows you to record up to four hours and 20 minutes. Nice, that's the weed number of audio along with up to three photos that'll be displayed while the audio is being played back. So that's pretty much all the recording features. Now, so far, none of this is really that shocking, but I mean, this is the recording process. What really can you add to it? Generally speaking, you press record and, and that's about it. However, with most camcorders, the playback process is also pretty boring, and that is where the disc cam sets itself apart. Most of its features are in the play slash edit mode, with emphasis on edit. Entering play mode, we're treated to a 3x3 grid of the clips on the disc, as is typical for most all digital camcorders. Now, this is a good time to bring up the fact that the LCD is actually a touchscreen. You can operate pretty much everything in the menus via touch, although in recording mode, the thumb wheel is faster for just about everything. Here, however, we have a substantially more sophisticated interface and using touch will save you some time. You can use your finger, of course, uh, but it also includes a stylus concealed in the LCD door, and it's even extendable so it'll fit your hand better. And for further ergonomic excellence, the hump, which I complained about earlier, actually serves as a kickstand. You can roll the camera on its back, and with the LCD flipped around, it actually holds it at a comfortable position for lengthy use, which, as you'll see, is very much in the design intent. The touch interface enables things like scrolling rapidly through a long list of clips. And of course, you can just tap whatever clip you want to play instead of having to roll through it with the thumb wheel. The LCD actually looks fantastic given the era. There are plenty of camcorders with LCDs that didn't represent the actual video very well, but this one is pretty accurate. While playing a video, you of course have the basics, pause, seek, track forward and back, but there's also a slow motion button, which allows variable speed playback. You can adjust the speed smoothly using the thumb wheel. I don't think I've seen this feature on anything. 
Back in the gallery view, you can tap the icon in the bottom right corner to see details about a selected clip, mark it as interesting, protect it from deletion, and even assign a title to it. Any clip with a title becomes a sort of fast travel destination. If you go into the menu here and select Jump, you can skip straight to any named clip in the gallery, which helps navigate packed disks. Now, about those menus. They're so packed that it's tough to pick a place to start, so I'm just going to kind of go from top to bottom because everything in here is pretty cool. The first menu has various playback features, and right off the bat we have another picture-in-picture -picture mode. But this one is one of the most interesting and unique features I've ever seen on any camcorder. With PIP turned on, while playing a video, you can press pause and then hit capture to store the current frame in the PIP. You can then continue playing with the frozen image down in the corner, and at any moment you can tap it to put the still side by side with the current video, either paused or playing at normal speed, or even in slow-mo. You can even go to another video clip while retaining the still from the previous one, so you can do frame comparisons between two clips. This is a completely nuts feature that had never been possible before without two cameras, two VCRs, or a computer. This is another flex. Another weirder option is the nine frame sequence. Here you select a clip, begin playing it, and then choose a place to pause. It offers you the option to step forward or back one frame at a time, and once you have the exact frame you want, press continue and it'll select the next eight frames and lay them all up on screen for review. You can then tap any one to zoom in. I'm not sure what this is for. Um, it seems kind of useless, although it's well implemented. There are a bunch of playback modes. Uh, you can have it just play straight through from the first clip to the last, repeat all, repeat just one clip, shuffle, and you can also loop just one segment within a clip or do intro scan, which basically plays the first two seconds of each clip to help you find one. All of this impossible on a videotape camera. You can sort by various properties, tell it how long to display stills when they're in a playlist, and select a transition to play between clips, a feature we'll touch on in a couple minutes. The next menu is where things start getting wacky. These are the editing controls, and they really are pretty full featured. Since this is a random access rewritable medium, you can of course delete any video clip that you don't like to free up space, but the editing capabilities go far beyond that. The simplest feature is Move, which lets you reorder clips within the disk so you can arrange them into a custom playlist. There's also Copy, however, which in fact fully duplicates a clip, and this is intended to give you a working copy so that you can use destructive editing features safely. The Trim option, for instance, does exactly what it sounds like. You pick a beginning and end of a clip, and it discards everything around it. So of course you might want to duplicate that clip first in case you mess up. If you don't like your results, you can just delete it, make a new copy, and go at it again. There's also Divide, which splits a clip into two clips, and Combine that does the opposite. With all these features so far, we have a basic assemble editing system. The disk can be thought of like a video project in a nonlinear editor, and the gallery view is like your timeline view. After you shoot your initial footage, you can go in, split it into clips, delete bad takes and unnecessary footage, and then shuffle things around to create a complete production, all within the camera. It goes without saying that this sort of thing didn't exist on tape camcorders, it was impossible, but beyond that, this wasn't available to anyone in the consumer market. Sure, professionals had video editing software on computers, but iMovie didn't even come out till the end of 1999, and if you didn't have a Mac, you'd probably never seen anything like this. Your best option was to use a pair of VCRs. Offering consumers non-linear video editing was incredibly novel, all on its own, but the disc cam doesn't stop there with the basics. It keeps going. Another feature here, for instance, is Still Frame Capture, which allows you to select a single frame from a video, extract and save it as a JPEG, and then use it as a clip wherever you like, and this works well with the next option, which is the Drawing feature. This calls up a little tiny graphics editor. You get a pencil, a line tool, box and circle, both empty and filled, and text, which you can use to mark up and annotate an image any way you like. You can use this on still images or on videos. The video will play while the art stays static on top of it. The camera can also generate simple title cards to insert between clips, but if you want, you can create a blank frame and then make custom titles by hand by drawing on it. Now, I don't think Sony had any business purposes in mind when they built this thing, but frankly, I think you could use this to make engaging presentations. Suppose, for instance, you were sent out to inspect a building, like my basement here. You could shoot video of things of interest, and then divide the resulting clips, splice out frames, annotate them, and assemble it back into a video that pauses periodically to display notes to illustrate your specific concerns. You could then hook this up to a projector, and you would have a presentation that had been shot, edited, and played back all inside this device. No VCRs, no computers, nothing. And that is badass. 
Whether anyone actually wanted to do that with this specific device is immaterial. The fact that you could is astonishing. And I wish that the business world had recognized the potential of this thing, but sadly it never happened. And I don't really think that's what Sony intended here anyway. Certainly, there are lots of consumer-focused features in this camera, like the stamp tool, which contains a whole bunch of very domestic prefab graphics. Happy birthday, thumbs up, that sort of thing. There's also the scene transition feature, which lets you add custom transitions between each clip. This is actually far more involved than it had to be. The option I pointed out earlier lets you set a crossfade to be used between all clips during playback. And they could have just stopped there, but instead they added the ability to put custom transitions at the beginning and end of every clip. There's a lot of transitions, and among them are some wipes, which even let you select which direction you want them to wipe. There were camcorders before this that offered wipe effects, but they just went in one direction and called it good, because it's a silly little gimmick feature. If you wanted customizable transitions, you would have actually paid a video editor to use real equipment. If you ask me, this is Sony's engineers going way past the sale. They didn't need to do this, but they did anyway. That said, one limitation does appear here. While Minidisc offers lots of new capabilities, it can't play two files at once. That's impossible. So during a transition, the video that's fading out freezes, and the video that's fading in is the only one that's playing. This was an impossible thing to overcome with the technology of the time, so it's hard to blame them. Also, if you and your brother are making a Final Fantasy movie, you can have accurate battle transitions. So all is forgiven. The last features in here are the picture effects, because of course, a camera from 1999 had to have silly sepia and black and white and mosaic filters. However, they're here instead of in the recording mode because you don't actually apply them to the footage. They're a post-processing effect that's added non-destructively. You can select a clip, tell it that it's sepia tone, play it back, and then if you don't like that effect, you can go back and remove it because it's being applied on the fly during playback. They're not actually modifying the footage. This is true for the drawing mode as well. You can delete everything you've scribbled on an image or clip at any time. So again, Sony just went way past the sale here. Non-destructive editing is something that every professional expects in their tools, but most consumers wouldn't even know what it meant, I think. This is the right way to do it, and of course, I wish everything worked this way, but it's both normal and much cheaper to just do it in a lazier, destructive way if you even provide any editing features at all. And this camera is full of that. It's got all these features that feel overwrought for the intended audience. For instance, when you're scrolling through the gallery, the thumbnails that appear aren't being generated from videos on the fly like most devices. They're actually stored in a database on the disk and they can be replaced. You can select Index Image Change, pause on a desired frame from a video, and then save that frame as a new thumbnail. What has that feature? Our operating systems don't have that feature. I don't think my video editor has that feature. You can also group clips together to make them behave like a single clip, but without actually combining them, so you can ungroup them later. This is very neat, and it's something I expect from a video editor, but who needs that for organizing their home movies? Usually, if you want to find a clip, you just press fast forward until you find the clip. The stakes aren't super high. Who is spending so much time watching their home movies that they actually need the sort of organizational tools that professionals expect? Now, I do have one theory, it's a weak one, but, it's possible that these tools were included because Sony anticipated that people would have a lot of discs with a lot of small clips on them. And to explain that supposition, I'm going to have to start getting into the problems. This camera is unquestionably very cool. However, it was also ahead of its time, of course. What do I ever talk about? 1999 was too early to be doing several of the things Sony was trying to achieve here, and it shows that in several specific and very unpleasant ways. Let's segue back to this in order to get where we're going. The quality of the video is not that hot. I think a contemporary DV camera would probably look a lot better in these same conditions. Now, those do shoot at 25 megabits, while this only shoots at 8. However, this uses MPEG-2, which I believe is a more efficient codec, and also 8 is very close to DVD, which is at about 10. Now, it's possible that, like the Hitachi MPEG cam, this just isn't putting that much effort into encoding those 8 megabits, or it's possible those extra 2 megabits really make a difference. But the reason that it's 8 megabits instead of 10 is probably because of the capacity of the disks. MD data first came out in about 1993, probably earlier in Japan, and I strongly suspect that Sony just took the original mini disk and put megabytes on it instead of minutes. The storage on those things was not amazing. About 140 megs, which was very cool in 93, but by 99 wasn't very much. Uh, fortunately, however, this camera does not use MD data. I lied to you. 
You know how I pulled the disc out earlier but refused to show it to you? That's because you've definitely never seen this format before. MD Data 2, also known as MD View. This was a development of MD Data, which bumped the capacity up considerably, all the way to 650 megs, the capacity of a full-size CD. Very impressive given its size. 650 megs. How much video can you fit in that? Well, one way to say it is not enough. But another way is 10 minutes. Maybe if you were shooting video the way people did with like old film home movie cameras, where you just hold the button long enough to get one little event, you know, your kid blowing out the birthday candles or whatever, and then you let go and it stops recording, maybe you could get a decent amount of interesting footage on this thing. And it actually has an option to record like that. But in any other circumstances, it wasn't gonna happen. This was the worst runtime of any new video format in history. Mini DVD did better. The MPEG cam did better. Every videotape format in history did better. You have to go all the way back to film cameras to find a runtime this poor. Now, of course, there were the lower bitrate modes. You could record in variable or four megabit, and that would get you up to 22 minutes, which still isn't good enough. So if you wanted to use this as your primary camcorder, you were going to have to own a lot of mini discs. And not just these ones, but MD View mini discs. Now, a contemporary magazine says that these were supposed to cost about $14.95, which in modern dollars is around 25 bucks, which doesn't sound so bad, but if you think about it, to get an hour of recording media, you would need to spend $150. That stings. For comparison, uh, tape was so cheap at this point that magazines didn't bother listing the prices anymore, but if you go back to like 1993, a high 8 tape that could get you two hours of excellent quality video was $8. So that's what this was up against. If they'd been able to get the density up to at least a gigabyte, then maybe at the lower bit rates at least, this could have stored at least a half hour of video. And while that sucks for 1999, it may have been enough to save the product. Unfortunately, Minidisc didn't reach the one gigabyte mile marker until 2004 with the high MD format, at which point the market for this was probably long gone. But hey, it's digital, so that makes it all okay, right? I mean, this is 1999, it's the era of the internet, of email, of easy digital distribution and editing of video. So the real meaning of Christmas here was just to take these home and load them into iMovie. Who cared how much you could fit on them? You were just gonna dump it all onto your hard drive anyway, right? This face should prepare you for disappointment. You may have noticed that this doesn't have Firewire. Now this may seem absurd for the time, even a DV camera from a year earlier was expected to have Firewire, but it's actually kind of impossible. The native format of Firewire is DV, and this doesn't shoot DV, it shoots MPEG-2. This was true for all the DVD camcorders as well. None of them had Firewire because they would have had to have some kind of MPEG-2 to DV conversion chip inside. It would have been a huge expense and you could just put the disc in your computer. But uh, you couldn't do that here because Sony didn't make an MD Data 2 drive, like ever. They never even announced one that I'm aware of. So how do you get the video onto your computer? Really? Honestly? You don't. I'm spoiling the ending by telling you the truth because I think you deserve to know. But for full disclosure, Sony did claim there was a way to do this. I'm gonna have to ask you to roll with me for this next sentence because the words don't chain together in a way that fits with our perceived reality. The only way to get the video onto your computer is over ethernet. You can chew on that one for a bit. Pause if you need to. I'll be here. I, I showed you the whole camera. There's no, there's no ethernet hole on it. I mean, the only thing I didn't show you was the battery compartment. I mean, there it is. See, there's no, no tricks up its sleeve. No, no ethernet jack in there. There's nothing. No. no, no, they didn't. Oh yes, they did. As with most camcorders of this era, if you want to run it off wall power, you need the battery simulacrum. This is a battery-shaped plastic thing with a cord coming out of it, which you shove into the battery compartment. It's got a little door here, so the cable can come out, and then it could run off of wall power. However, it doesn't just provide power, it also provides ethernet. The little plastic door in there slides back so that these pins can connect the RJ45 through to the camera. Uh, you will notice there's way more than eight, which I think is because this also contains a digital audio port for some reason. Uh, it's both uh, optical and copper. There's a little transceiver way down inside of there. I don't know why this thing needs digital audio input, given that it can't actually record music mini discs, although it can play them back, which is a neat feature. But back to the nonsensical ethernet. 
You're supposed to plug this into your computer with a crossover cable. By the way, if you happen to get one of these, it doesn't work very well through switches. You really want to plug it straight in if you can. Then you assign a static IP address to the camera, at which point it turns up a web server. Now, this is not ideal to begin with, but I can't really think of a better way to do it. An FTP server or like a Windows SMB share would have been equally non-ideal choices for this time. So I guess this is the most universal and compatible option. The design of the interface itself looks a lot nicer than I expected for the era, but it's not really intended for bulk downloads, and that is a serious problem. Since it's an embedded web server from 1999, it is of course dog slow. Uh, it takes forever to send you a grid of thumbnails. And then once you get them, you can click on them to download one file. Now this is how you can get your stills off of here. If you just click on a JPEG, you just get the JPEG. So that's nice, I suppose. But videos are a different story. You probably want to just suck all the files off onto your hard drive, right? Well. If you try to start multiple transfers, you'll almost certainly crash the web server. And besides, the mini disk can't actually read two files at once. So if you have a download manager that can limit it to one file at a time, I suppose you could queue them all up and let them download. Uh, the bigger problem, however, is that the maximum transfer speed seems to be about 12 kilobytes per second, at which speed 140 megabytes would take about three hours. Now this makes no sense. The camera can play back your video in real time, which tells us the drive can play at eight megabits per second, and the ethernet interface is at least 10 megabits per second. So it should only take 10 minutes max to copy a whole disk over to your PC. So why is it so much slower? Well, the reason is that you aren't actually downloading the video you shot. Notice the two boxes at the top here. One sets the resolution of the video and the other sets the frame rate. Yes, by default, your video downloads at one quarter resolution and only five frames per second. Now, not only does that suck super turbo bad, it also tells us that the camera is converting the video on the fly for some reason. Indeed, if we look at the downloaded file, it turns out to be native QuickTime format, which at least at this time was MJPEG. So this would explain why it's so slow. The disk cam is converting it from one codec to the other on the fly. I would guess it only has like a Cracker Jack 20 megahertz CPU at best, and like a couple megs of RAM to work with. So it's just completely starved of resources and is struggling to produce more than a few pixels per second. On top of that, I think the MJPEG is even bigger than the MPEG-2 is because it says a two minute file is gonna take three hours to transfer. That math doesn't add up. That's more like 20 hours to transfer an entire disc. This is completely nuts. This is what had me choosing video titles like Sony's mini disc mistake and how to make mini discs suck. I changed my mind for reasons I'll explain, but this is still a huge flub on Sony's part. All they needed to do was to pipe the raw video out to the user's computer, and I think I know why they did it, but it still doesn't make it any better. My guess is that they felt that contemporary computers were not up to the task of playing and editing MPEG-2 video, and that's fair. There were still a lot of Pentium 2s floating around in 1999, and people were still buying dedicated MPEG-2 decoders. However, this was not the right solution. The correct thing to do was to offer the user the quarter resolution video as a thumbnail, then let them download the full res MPEG-2 and convert it on their PC in software, where their much faster CPU could do it in minutes instead of hours. If nothing else, this would let you turn the camera off so it's not sitting there scrubbing the drive back and forth for 20 hours. And you could also swap disks and start downloading more clips while the first batch was busy being converted. I know people will say that this is a codec licensing issue, but I call bullshit. That doesn't stop Sony from giving you the files. It's your problem whether you can do something with them. Maybe you're a business that has a licensed encoder. Maybe Sony could have sold you one. Not giving the user their own damn files is just rude. So that's why none of the footage you've seen so far was actually downloaded from the camera. I couldn't bring myself to let this rare artifact sit and scrub its head back and forth for 16 hours until it destroyed itself. For all I know, it's the only working one left on the planet. So instead I just plugged it into my DV deck and dubbed it all off over analog, which looks pretty good. Now I did get like 30 seconds of video off over the ethernet before I chickened out and unplugged it. Uh, it's actually footage of me talking about a different camera. So I'm gonna put that up on screen next to the analog capture so you can compare them now. Excellently with any conceivable situation I put it in because it's a three CCD high-end prosumer camera from the mid 2000s, it's not surpri- Early 2000s? Early 2000s? Early 2000s? Probably. Basically, it's not much better, if at all, and if you had a $150 analog capture card, you were better off just using that. I would love to see what the underlying MPEG-2 looked like, but it seems like I'll never get that chance. Now, complicating matters, of course, there was a firmware update for this thing, which I'll never be able to get since it was distributed exclusively on Minidisc, a method I'm glad we don't use anymore. 
The most exciting feature here is unquestionably the Parappa the Rapper image stamps, but there's also this very strangely worded disk to disk copying feature. This says that it lets you use your computer as a temporary storage location to store videos in their original quality while moving them from disk to disk. This is weird, and I'm not commenting on the machine translation. I'm saying that this is a bizarre feature to implement in those terms. It feels strained to me. In other words, it feels like Sony identified a problem that their users found unacceptable, and they were trying to solve it while also not conceding something that their executives demanded they not concede. To me, original video quality means one thing. This allows you to copy off the original MPEG-2 files. And for some reason, the engineers have been told that they weren't allowed to tell anyone that that's what it was doing. So that's a punch in the gut, right? I mean, like I said, I was about to tank this entire video, make it a hate fest over this one problem. And it is a big problem. And I'm sure that contemporary video nerds didn't like it either. I have found evidence that they were irritated at the lack of Firewire, for instance, and I'm sure this would have bugged them as well if they'd actually bought one. But what I realized is this wasn't intended for them. If you wanted to edit on your computer, you could buy a Firewire camera. My complaints about them are largely nitpicks, and they must have worked well because there was a whole video industry around them. Sony, however, designed this device not for videographers with IMAX, but for a completely different approach to video making. Their product people presented this as a complete shooting and editing system that didn't require a PC. Removing the computer from the equation was their goal. So it's not surprising that they didn't include good methods for it, although I don't think it was really worth the apparent snub that we've witnessed here. But maybe that's just Sony being Sony. So I'd like to argue that we should ignore the PC compatibility issue and judge this only on its merits. Unfortunately, PC compatibility was the only thing that could have saved it, because as soon as you look at its merits, you come right back to 10 minutes. Since you can't copy the footage to your computer or any other medium, that means you're going to be forever tethered to these little boxes of expensive proprietary disks that you're going to be swapping out constantly in order to get any decent amount of footage. That really isn't forgivable, especially once you see the price tag. I mean, this is always how this part of the script goes, right? You expected the disc cam to be flawed and also stupidly expensive, and it doesn't disappoint. $2,300. That's $3,700 in today's money. You could take that kind of cash and buy a Blackmagic Ursa Mini 4K and have money left over for another lens. The sticker shock must have felt like a skinned knee, and adding the revelation about the runtime must have felt like rubbing salt in it. A much lower price or a much larger disc could have saved this thing, but Sony was either unwilling or unable to manifest either. I wish so badly that Sony had figured out the capacity issue more quickly, because then this could have been the weird early adopter product that's way too expensive and not really very practical, but that paves the way for a whole lineage of devices that follow in its footsteps. This could have eventually grown into a device that used a hard drive and then an SD card, and maybe all modern camcorders would offer a fleet of mobile editing features like this. We can't imagine what would have happened if that had been the future we got, but because Sony screwed this up, all modern camcorders are probably based on the Hitachi DVD cameras, which don't offer anything nearly this sophisticated, really through no fault of their own. The DVD format is just not suited to the kind of shenanigans that Sony was getting up to here. So for the next five to eight years, nobody had an opportunity to try again. So by the time tiny hard drives and flash memory became affordable for camcorder use, this little experiment had been long forgotten. That's it. Pour one out for the last interesting camera. Thanks for watching. If you like this, please subscribe so I know you're into this sort of thing. Remember to turn on notifications because I upload kind of regularly. Also, if you really like this, consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing. It costs a lot to collect this sort of stuff, especially when I have to do things like buying two of them to get one working set. So without their support, I literally couldn't do it. I'm grateful to all of them and all of you for watching. Thanks.